I'm Gwyneth Paltrow, and you're listening to The Goop Podcast, thanks to our friends at Prime Video and their new series, Homecoming. One of the season's most visually striking shows started as a podcast that's unlike any other I've listened to. Homecoming, the cult hit podcast, was created by Eli Horowitz and Micah Bloomberg, and the series, which stars Julia Roberts, debuted last month on Prime Video. In the series, Julia Roberts plays a former caseworker, Heidi, who worked at a facility where they helped soldiers transition back to the everyday. Four years later, Heidi is living another life when a Department of Defense auditor turns up to ask her about why she left her job, which is when Heidi realizes that her past and the stories she's been telling herself are not quite what they seemed. This is the kind of series that begs to be binge-watched. Homecoming is exclusive to Prime Video, so just tune in there to fall down its rabbit hole. Hi again. Thanks for joining us. If this is your first time, here's what you can expect. Every Thursday and a bunch of Tuesdays coming up, Goop editors will be sitting down with thought leaders who are pushing boundaries in their fields. We'll talk to doctors, creatives, CEOs, and relationship experts. You'll hear me interviewing some of the people I admire most in this world, and you'll also hear a lot from my chief content officer at Goop, Elise Lunin. I love listening to Elise's interviews because she asks the smartest questions and really just listens. Today, we're starting a three-part special on mental health, so be sure to tune in the next few Tuesdays. Our first guest is psychiatrist Dr. Kelly Brogan. She's the author of A Mind of Your Own, The Truth About Depression and How Women Can Heal Their Bodies to Reclaim Their Lives. Dr. Brogan is most known for her holistic and sometimes controversial approach to identifying the root causes of disease and depression. She's also known for putting down her prescription pad. Dr. Brogan told Elise about what she calls medicine's dirty little secret and why healing the body might be the way to heal the mind. The first order of business is let's heal your body, right? Let's just start there because if you have blood sugar imbalance or you have a thyroid condition or you have you know, a B12 deficiency, or you have gut imbalance, which nearly 100% of the people I work with have, then let's start with the lowest hanging fruit, right? Reverse that and then see what we're really dealing with, right? So are you actually an irritable, tired, you know, moody person who has insomnia? Perhaps not. And you'll know in 30 days, literally, the body is that forgiving. Before we get to Elise's interview with Dr. Brogan, let's talk about one of our partners. If you've been following Goop for a bit, you'll know we're into essential oils. And if you get our newsletters, then you might have seen the new essential oil diffuser we launched with Vitruvi. The color, called French Grey, was picked out by GP, and it's sort of the defining shade of the company. Vitruvi is a dream company to work with. It's run by siblings Sarah and Sean Panton. They make beautiful stone diffusers that look at home in any office, bedroom, or living space. We like to keep them on our desks, nightstands, and right by the bath. This way, a little pick-me-up is never far away. You just drop a Vitruvi essential oil in to be diffused with water. My favorite Vitruvi scents are probably grapefruit, eucalyptus, and lavender. But whichever essential oils you choose, the diffuser ends up making the air in your space feel like you've just walked into the waiting room of a world-class spa. Between the steam and the sophisticated scent, I always find myself feeling a little more at ease when my Vitruvi diffuser is on in the background, and it's a nice change of pace from your typical candle. This time of year, we have the bergamot and frankincense scents in heavy rotation at Goop. And, spoiler alert, a lot of people on our holiday list will be getting a Vitruvi diffuser paired with a box of their essential oils. This also makes a good house gift to bring to friends hosting holiday parties this year. Just head over to Vitruvi.com and you can take 20% off your order with code GOOP20. That's GOOP20. Okay, let's get to Elise and Dr. Brogan. Dr. Brogan, how I know you were clinically trained, you were very much part of the mainstream medical establishment, and then you took a right turn. So what was what happened? Yeah, I call it a left turn, <laughs> but it's, it was very dramatic, you know, and you'll find that most 
you know, you might call them turncoat doctors, Mm -hmm. made the change because of their lived experience around the limitations of conventional medicine. And my story was no different. I was diagnosed postpartum with an autoimmune condition called um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I didn't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life. You know, it was sort of okay for my patients to do that. But once it came to my experience, I sought alternatives, which was very uncharacteristic of me at the time, but I sort of knew what conventional medicine had to offer. And I put my, uh, what could have been chronic illness into remission on paper, felt like a million bucks. And I said, hold on a minute. (laughs) I never learned that this was possible. I've always been sort of a science nut. And so I went, you know, to pubmed.gov and (laughs) spent a couple years trying to learn, you know, a broader version of the truth about prescribing and, and healing. Yeah. It's interesting. So many, obviously, autoimmune disease affects so many, it's 10 to 1, right? So many more women than men. And I think it is exactly what you're saying seems to be that moment of crisis for so many people, becoming a mom, experiencing that Mm -hmm. first hormonal shift, and then going to your doctor to say, I don't feel well, and being sort of rebuffed with like, mm-hmm. it's normal, or you're tired because you have a child. That's right. Um, yeah. And that sort of denying, denying what you know is true, which I think is why there are so many women who feel disenfranchised and unheard. And that's often how women end up in psychiatrist's office or end up prescribe psychiatric medications, right? Because they're told it's all in your head, you Mm -hmm. know, (laughs) it's just the stress of your life wanting to take the edge off. And it, of course, it makes sense, you know, to, to avail yourself of modern medicine and it's, and it's many gifts, but what if there's a reversible root cause driver Mm -hmm. that if only you knew, you know, the steps to take to resolve, you enter into the next chapter of your life, you know, just through this portal. It's also interesting to just think about the context of of PubMed and research, and I, you would know better than I would, but it feels like there's a dearth of research around some of these more insidious issues that are so incapacitating for women. And, you know, I'm not sure, I would love to hear actually what your protocol was for addressing your Hashimoto's, but when you go to doctors and you say, actually, like, I complete, I did a detox, like, I cleaned up my diet, and they're like, detox is bullshit. Right, right. And you're like, but that's weird because I feel amazing. Right, right, right. But I don't know how medicine and how doctors can start to sort of build up this other side that is more, le- is less conventional in terms of like weight of evidence. Well, firstly, women are not researched. Mm-hmm. It's a dirty little secret about, you know, the, yeah. the world of science and, and medical uh, sort of exploration they are rarely the subject of research. And what we do know, which I find pretty compelling, is that women respond differently behaviorally, so symptomatically, to the most um, prevalent driver of illness, which is inflammation, Mm -hmm. right? So now we are understanding that all of these chronic illnesses that we thought were all separate entities, you have to see all your different specialists, are in fact perhaps all driven by the body's language of distress, which is inflammation. It's an effort on the part of the body to recalibrate around a perceived imbalance, right? And so women are very sensitive to this. So the same amount of inflammation in a man and a woman would manifest differently in terms of symptoms and behaviors. And so what I find, you know, powerful is that in my research and exploration of the literature, there is a lot of science to support what are these maybe ancient, traditional, indigenous, you know, practices to support this notion that, in fact, when you make a lifestyle intervention, you're having this reverberative effect all over in many different systems of the body that are, in fact, connected, Mm -hmm. not, you know, the way we imagine, like sort of a, a butcher shop, you know, diagram of a cow being sliced up kind of a thing. And and so that's, you know, sort of the, the place I come from is, in, in fact, let's, let's zoom out, take a breath, try to assess how we got off course and look at how we have over the past 150 years of industrialization really lost our, our way, mm-hmm. you know, health wise and, and in many other ways and intuitively feel into what would be a simple solution, right? Like the Occam's razor of our, you know challenge right now, and then find the science that supports that. And that's the science that I curate, which I think tells a very elegant and beautiful story about the capacity of the body to heal. Mm -hmm. 
It's so interesting, too. Like, the, the way that medicine has been sort of bifurcated and that you're no longer just a doctor. I mean, everyone goes to medical school, right? Like, when you become a psychiatrist, like, you have you are a doctor of the whole body, yet somehow, you right. know, it's like you're a pulmonologist or you're a cardiologist, right. and I think people forget how to heal. In the same way that I think when we look at women, it's like you're a mom or you're a you're this or you're That's that. Right. And um, I think there's also simultaneously something coming to women coming together to be like, wait, like, I don't need to be one thing. I can be many things simultaneously. Absolutely. That's a great parallel because we are very tempted by the reductionist, you know, possibilities. Like, oh, A leads to B. It's simple. Here's the fix. And, and this is sort of the about 300 years of, of medicine is predicated on this idea that there's one gene that leads to one illness that leads to one pill, you know, mm-hmm. that, you, that you take for life. And what we are discovering, again, through some pretty powerful science, much of which falls under the category of quantum biology, quantum physics, is that we are not a complicated machine, you know. Mm-hmm. In fact, this is a complex system. And, and so to embrace complexity is a little uncomfortable, right, because we have to sit with paradoxes and mm-hmm. we have to sit with uncertainty and, you know, we have to sit with the fact that there's a lot of subjectivity and highly personal um, variables. Mm -hmm. So we can no longer rely on the kinds of trials that have been the foundation of pharmaceutically based medicine, which is the randomized placebo Mm -hmm. controlled trial. That's now coming under question when we look at you know, things like biochemical individuality and epigenetics and your personal microbiome, which is an entire inner ecology that's mm-hmm. driving the expression of your genes and your experience of your, you know, health and wellness. So it's exciting, but also we are in that, you know, as my friend Charles Eisenstein would say, the, the space between stories. Mm-hmm. Like we're in this nether region between an old, tired paradigm and something new that we haven't yet really entered into. That's really well put. I think it's that that gray area. Women, I think, are more comfortable there. But yes. this idea of like no one owns the truth, and the truth is still, if it's still emerging, like it feels it feels like we're on the breakthrough. It's interesting you talked about quantum biology and quantum physics, but that clearly there are systems and there are things that we cannot explain with our experience and language today that are completely subjective, but can't be denied, like that doesn't make them untrue. Exactly. And those are the kinds of experiences, you know, something like my reversing my Hashimoto's, when you have an experience that you can't explain through all of the things you're familiar with already, all the rules and regulations of the universe, then you have to sort of sit in the confusion for a little bit until you grow a bigger you know, container for your experience. And what you said is exactly right. You know, in in fact, some, you know, scientists and biologists feel that one of the reasons women are better able to capacitate this kind of complexity is because we have a thicker, what's called a corpus callosum, which is the brain bridge that connects the right and left parts than, than, you know, relative to men. And so we are better multitaskers and we are better able to hold um, multiple different concepts at once, even if they are even internally dissonant. So Mm -hmm. we are, I think, heralding this new story. I love, I've never heard that, but I love that. Makes sense, Uh, right? It totally makes sense. So in terms of thinking of psychiatric disorders and the way that the gut impacts the brain and the mind, and do you feel like every disorder within like the psychiatric realm can be treated through the gut? (laughs) I do, in fact. Uh, Many people ask me, you know, well, where are the carve-outs? You know, there must be some serious mental illnesses that require medication, for example. Um, you know, I sort of backed my way into this in, in, through my own experience and then began to explore the literature to see, you know, what I hadn't been told. Mm-hmm. I read a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic that completely changed my life by an uh, investigative journalist named Robert Whitaker. And in this book, he suggests through his evaluation as a journalist, you know, he's got no skin in the game. Uh, He suggests that it's actually medications, whether it's stimulants, uh, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, uh, mood stabilizers, so they're called, that are driving chronic 
illness, chronic mental illness. That's a pretty provocative statement, right? But he uses what's called non-industry published literature. So these are non-pharma funded studies, theoretically more objective. And he demonstrates that what used to be, you know, single episode experiences of psychosis, perhaps, or major, you know, depressive illness have now become almost a lifestyle of chronic recidivistic disease, right? And how has, how has that happened? How do we have more prescribing than ever before and also more mental health disability the world over than ever before, right? Like, shouldn't those be mm-hmm. inversely proportional? And so that was what gave me pause around everything I had been taught about medication. But it was actually my own personal, like, recovery experience that gave me the tools to generate an alternative. And so what I have discovered through my own clinical practice and then through, you know, an online program of thousands of people I've never even met, you know, who are essentially doing this on their own, Mm -hmm. is that there is no carve out. I mean, I have, you know, reversal of chronic treatment resistant schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, psychotic um, depression, OCD, you know, I have video testimonials all over my website. And you know, you could say those are all anecdotal, but sure, if you know this is possible, perhaps inside you it activates a desire to explore it, right? So this is not for everyone, mm-hmm. but I do believe that the availability of the option needs to be foregrounded for anyone who is struggling, you know, to know that perhaps your symptoms are telling you something about what needs to change. And, you know, you don't have to necessarily know the exact answer to what needs to change, but that's why I advocate for doing a whole sweep of your lifestyle so that you can send your nervous system, send your gut, send your hormones a signal of safety, right? And see how they respond because the body knows how to correct itself nearly automatically when you create the conditions. That's that's fascinating. And I think knowing way too many people in my own life who have bipolar and it seems so intractable and so it's just it's overwhelmingly sad I think for some of those chronic um that there aren't better solutions yes um so it's good to know that you're finding finding success in some things that seem outside of the scope of of medicine that are more chronic. I'm assuming that a lot of people come to you because they're not finding answers within right. the conventional world and they are looking to wean themselves off. Do you see patients who are in crisis or do they tend to come to you post crisis? <laughs> crisis is probably the defining feature of my <laughs> clinical practice. And I think that um, not only do people come to me in crisis, but actually crisis can emerge Um, fortunately or unfortunately, from the process of medication taper. When I started to offer women the opportunity to taper medication, I had never been taught how to do it. Um, And so I just sort of, you know, used common sense. And I was basically running like a rehab center, Um, paged around the clock. I had 15% of my practice probably on medical disability. And if you haven't gone through uh, a medication taper off of psychiatric medications or known someone who has, you would never believe that it could be harder than, you know, stopping a crack cocaine habit or an opiate addiction or alcohol. Uh, You would never imagine that. I didn't, and I'd been prescribing these meds for years. But it's a reality, and now since 2014, it's actually acknowledged in the medical literature that these medications, psychiatric medications, cause a very significant withdrawal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I've found that for whatever reason, you know, the the universe has presented this opportunity uh, to women today as almost a, an, an opportunity for initiation to themselves, because it can be a real dark night of the soul, as you know, as it's called. This process of not only you know stabilizing and restabilizing physically throughout the process, which my approach and protocol is really mainly focused on, like creating a strong, resilient physical vessel for the stressor of tapering. But then, of course, there's the psycho-spiritual aspect of, you know, what were you saying no to when you started medication? What emotional experience? What behavioral state? What about your cognition? What were you saying no to? Because it's probably still there, right? And and are you better prepared, which odds are you are, to encounter it and work with it and 
walk through the wound, you know, mm -hmm. rather than uh, paper it over, you know, with Band-Aids. And so this is actually, I think, one of the skills I bring to this space is a, is a deep comfort with other people's discomfort, you know, and, and an ability to just sort of midwife the process and sit there and say, you got this, because it does transform, you know, many of my patients experience suicidality and a kind of hopelessness that I actually see as a harbinger of change and transformation if you don't reflexively jump on it, you know, with fear and reactivity. It does transform. It can be almost like like a death throw of your old self. And, you know, the, the statement I hear most often from women I work with and people in my uh, online program, once they're through this birth canal, so to speak, is... I finally feel like myself. And I found that so interesting. I would hear it over and over again. And I thought it was so interesting because we think we want to be more beautiful, more thin, more rich, more, you know, have better sex in our life, have, you know, better relationships. But the truth is we just want to feel comfortable in our own skin and we just want to feel like we know who we are. And that, for whatever reason, is the most common result of this process of, you know, eliminating medication from your life and also speaking to your body organism in a different way, understanding that it is wise in ways that we have only been taught to ignore, you know? Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. GP sold me on the Prime Video series Homecoming when she interviewed Julia Roberts for the Goob podcast. Julia Roberts stars in the series and is also an executive producer on it. As GP said, it's a series that quite literally pushes you to the edge of your seat, but it's not scary per se. The whole time you're trying to figure out what exactly you're watching and how the mystery of the story will unfold. The tone is so unique. It's directed by Sam Esmail, who also brought us Mr. Robot and who is clearly brilliant. In the series, Julia Roberts plays a former caseworker, Heidi, who worked at a center where they helped soldiers transition back to the everyday. Four years later, Heidi has started a new life where she works as a waitress and lives in a small town with her mom, who is played by the very brilliant Sissy Spacek. Heidi doesn't talk about why she left the homecoming transitional support center, and it's all you want to know. When a Department of Defense auditor turns up to ask Heidi about the center, things get interesting. As the series cuts back and forth between Heidi's past and present, it becomes clear that there's an entirely different story behind the one she's been telling herself. Julia Roberts is crazy good in this series, and you just have to watch it to unravel the story yourself. Homecoming is exclusive to Prime Video, so be sure to tune in there. This might make me sound like a total maniac, but a while ago, my husband Rob and I made a mini challenge of trying to shower as fast as possible in an effort to cut down on how much water we use. I can usually get in and out of the shower in two minutes, and that's even accounting for the days I use Goop's Himalayan salt scrub as my shampoo. It's like a massage for your scalp. But then again, I do have very short hair. Once I'm out of the shower, I take a little more time. And because I work at Goop, we think about things like what are the towels that we use every day made of? Under the Canopy is one brand that's invested a lot in this question, and I think they get it really right. Their bath collection is made from organic cotton, and it's GOTS certified, which is the major global standard for organic material. Under the Canopy stays away from potentially harmful chemicals, dyes, and GMOs. And they also make a point to conserve water and energy throughout their production process. Oh, and the towels themselves are great. They get a little bit softer with every wash, and the bath rugs absorb as much water as you need. Everything in the collection starts at really appealing prices, too. So, if you're looking to update your bathroom, check out Under the Canopy's organic cotton bath towels and rugs. You'll find them exclusively at Bed Bath & Beyond stores and online at bedbathandbeyond.com. Okay, let's get back to Elisa's interview with Dr. Brogan. We work with a lot of therapists and, and almost coaches who are tired of sort of the old paradigm of talk therapy and the fact that you don't, you know, you're not giving people tools, you're not this sort of, I think we've all been there, right? Talking to someone where you're just talking at a therapist and they're yeah. just nodding and you are just reliving and you're, there's no movement. So how much of your practice is also 
sort of coaching or like the birthing of these traumas or the unearthing? Like how how active do you see? Like how important is it to go to, to go back and sort of like bury out the trauma and find it and get get it? That's a great question. And, you know, it took me a long time as someone who very much believed in the gene-based model of disease. I was, you know, like so many conventional doctors, I thought, who cares? Get over it. Like, why does it matter what you dealt with? Why does it matter what you eat? Why does it matter whether you exercise? It's, it's your illness. You inherited it. And this is just your deal. Okay. So take your meds and shut up. Like that's literally, you know, what I was trained to um, experience. But what I found in my bias, and I have many, you know, holistic practitioners as friends who have very different approaches, equally, if perhaps even if not more effective than my own. But my bias is that there's an order of operations. And the first order of business is let's heal your body, right? Let's just start there. Because if you have blood sugar imbalance, or you have a thyroid condition, or you have, you know, a B12 deficiency, or you have gut imbalance, which nearly 100% of the people I work with have, then let's start with the lowest hanging fruit, right? Reverse that and then see what we're really dealing with, right? So are you actually an irritable, tired, you know, moody person who has insomnia? Perhaps not. And you'll know in 30 days, literally, the body is that forgiving. So let's start there so that you feel you have a strong foundation from which to begin to confront and explore the material that's going to inevitably come up now that there is a clearer space, right? Because if you're distracted by your PMS and your headaches and your gas and bloating and your achy joints, you're probably not going to feel so inclined to explore the bigger questions in your life. Like, are you in the right profession? Are you married or partnered to the right person? You know, should you still be talking to your brother, you know, what about your parents, you know, are you here to procreate or not, you know, these sort of, should you be living in New York, you're distracted by the white noise of your body's imbalance. And so if we can quiet that, then inevitably, what happens is the journey begins. That's what I've found. And the journey almost always consists of simply watching what comes up. So that's a, you know, a big, big advocacy, advocacy of mine and, and so many other people in, I think, you know, the spiritual space, which is just get comfortable with witnessing, right? And so if you witness that, you know, every time you are interacting with your dad, you feel this like burning rage in your chest, look at it. And just acknowledge that it's there before you try and fix it or figure out what it's about or have some coping tool, right? So first to witness. But what I have learned is what so many people, you know, have also supported, which is this idea that our early adverse experiences, right? So early childhood trauma sets in play programs that we then recapitulate throughout our lives. And there is a way to bring an awareness to those programs. Simply the awareness can begin to dissolve them, right? It's simply bringing consciousness to those patterns. How do you quarterback this for thousands and thousands of people? And are there other sort of things outside of the realm of what you would traditionally have used? Like, do you... I'm, I'm just... Uh, actually totally curious. Like, are you like, go get past life regression or yeah. like what, what's in your toolkit that's yeah. outside of the parameters of what you can actually do? Yeah. So the primary one, honestly, and I, I think perhaps my greatest contribution is just the mindset around it, right? So if you come at this experience with a mindset of curiosity, almost like an anthropologist, like with a headlamp on, um, and you begin to explore the possibility that there is meaning, right, or purpose even to the trajectory of experience, then you are already defying literally hundreds of years of assumptions that we are, as my favorite philosopher Alan Watts would say, you know, flesh robots on a dead rock floating in the middle of nowhere, right? So this idea that everything is random and purposeless, we're at the mercy of these forces that we are working through technology and science to try and manage, and that it's only a matter of time before we have the whole code cracked, right? That's what we all grew up in, but that's actually crumbling, 
literally in our lifetime, you know, I now believe it's possible that this entire paradigm will will crumble. And so what emerges from it is this um, this sort of rich fabric of connectedness. So this idea that you're held by some design, right? And sometimes called quantum entanglement, that we're all connected in some powerful way. That's not like some kumbaya, like oneness thing, right? It's actually a phenomenon. It explains why, you know, all 8 million people in Manhattan don't get on the FDR drive at the same time. Like, probabilistically that, you know, it's these anomalies should occur, but they don't. And it's because there is some way that we are all working together. And this is, you know, part of the concept of polarities, right? That that everything can't be good, right? Because then how do you know what's good? If everything is good, there has to be, you know, the challenges, the shadow, the negative to the positive. And I think um, it's through understanding this sort of deeper, I guess, uh, perspective, that then when you encounter challenges, you encounter grief, you encounter pain, there's some little part of you that's saying, all right, give me the goods. <laughs> like, what's in here for me? There's something in this for me. There's some meaning here for me to extract, right? And there isn't just that resistance that says, this sucks, get me out of it. And so I actually think the mindset is the primary one, uh, but I've also explored a number of different energy medicine modalities from flower essences to homeopathy to shamanism, plant medicine, that I find are sort of accelerators of this mm -hmm. process. And I myself um, have found so much um, support through Kundalini Yoga. It's it's an old branch mm -hmm. of, of yoga that's very focused on consciousness transformation. And, you know, I think that people are almost always attracted to exactly what is going to help them most once they get clear. It's an interesting idea. I think, too, with a lot of the, the ancient practices that we obviously explore a fair amount on Goop, there it's so subtle. Um, and I think it's so powerful for so many people because it's also so intention aligned. It's what you said, like looking for the thing that might serve you or whether it's a flower essence and it revolves around a ritual where you are, you know, the intent is there. Um, it's, it's so mindful. Yes. But I think that that greater, the greater framework of finding your purpose, what we aren't automated robots. Our mind is clearly, there is a separation between mind and brain. So we think, right? I would imagine when you can crack that open for people and sort of reframe, like, what, what are my life lessons? Like, why is this happening to me? Why did I, like, why did I maybe choose my parents? Is that the biggest aha moment? Or are there other moments that emerge as people go on this path with you that are more mind shattering? I think it's almost like the mind has a front row seat to the show, right? But it's a felt experience. It's a, it's a felt authenticity, right? That, that as you move through this process that inevitably has, you know, tight spaces to squeeze through, um, you more and more feel like, oh, finally, this is who I am, right? I mean, I myself look back on, you know, video clips or photos of myself even six years ago, and I almost feel like, oh, that's cute that I thought I was <laughs> that person, you know? And and so that's, it's this lived in your skin felt experience of becoming more and more who you are that makes and drives your commitment to sticking to the path. It's almost like opening Pandora's box. Once you open it, you can't, you can't close it, right? So you can't unknow the things you've learned, but your body also has a deeper experience of your own truth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that that's where you begin to trust your compass yeah. and you don't have to drive the car the way you thought you did, which of course is a very masculine energy. Mm -hmm. um, this notion that your, your life is going to fall apart if you don't manage it. Well, actually many of us, you know, have discovered that in fact, the less we do, the more we are receptive to those subtle cues and the more we begin to feel, you know, uh, in our, even in our bodies, um, you know, what is best for us in a given moment, even if it seems cognitively dissonant to make that choice, mm -hmm. then it feels better. Yeah. And it's interesting too, to figure out sort of that autonomy, right? Because I think 
when you when you enter into a relationship with the doctor, you're sort of giving, you're investing your trust in them. They're telling you what to do. And I think throughout, there's this framework of like, life happens to you. Yes. You're a victim of your circumstances. Yes. And I think for, for, I'm sure, so many of your patients, not to make not to jump to conclusions, but probably even just putting them back in themselves, back in the driver's seat, although also letting life happen is, is really important. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing observation you're making because what I found is while I have um, incredible outcomes that actually even shock me in my practice, my outcomes through my online program are even more robust. I never met these people, okay? So how could you explain that? Well, one explanation is that I have an, a community online, which I don't have for my patients, right? And that we are, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, you know, that the community is the guru of the future, that we are in a phase of our development as humans where we are re rediscovering the power of that field, uh, that shared field of healing potential, right? So that's a big part of it. But I think another part of it is, is exactly what you're referencing, which is that the more you're doing this, right? The more you are reclaiming this process and the more in charge you are, right? Which is even more the case when I haven't interacted with the you know person versus when I have, um, the more perhaps even on a nervous system level, you're getting that signal that everything is really okay because otherwise you wouldn't be in a position to do that. And that's why I've come to the conclusion that the, the sort of victim mindset, while it may feel good for a moment, to say, oh, it's my disease, that's why I have this, and here's what I do, I take medications, it's not my fault. In the end, it's ultimately a very disempowering and unsatisfying uh, way to live. And so the, the middle step is, is an uncomfortable one, and it, again, it's not for everyone, but the middle step is taking radical responsibility and saying, I chose that, now I'm gonna choose this. Mm -hmm. We, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Anita Marjani, but she said something that re was very resonant for me. She had the spontaneous healing from end stage cancer, and she said um, what she learned. She had this near death experience. Yes, I bet. Um, yeah. That what she learned was that it is her responsibility it was her responsibility to heal herself, and it doesn't mean that she is responsible for sort of the traumas that maybe informed her disease, but she is responsible to herself to work through them which I feel like is also for people who have suffered extreme trauma, like it is not your fault, but it is your responsibility to now sort of take care of yourself and um, respond. Yeah, respond. it's like almost in the word. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I could talk to you all day. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Total pleasure. I love this conversation. Thanks for listening to today's conversation. You can learn more about Dr. Brogan's work on her site, kellybroganmd.com and on goop.com slash the podcast. I thought Dr. Brogan's description of the temptation of reductionist possibilities was very interesting. It can be a challenge for us to sit in the gray when the truth is still emerging, but I think for so many of us that it's the ultimate reward. That's it for this episode of the Goop Podcast. If you have a chance, please rate, review, and let us know what you think. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And don't forget to tell your friends. For more info, check out goop.com slash the podcast. See you soon.